Well, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my great friend, Mr. Tom Cochran. And Tom, why don't you go ahead and come on up here? I wish I... Yeah, give him a round of applause. Fortunately for you guys, Tom's a little more reserved than I am. He's a little more politically correct when he's up here. So uh, you don't have to worry about him probably offending as many people as I do. So that's a good thing. But Tom and I, um, Rod, didn't I ask for something to stand on whenever Tom came up here? <laughs> just crouch down. There you go. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Tom and I have actually had the pleasure of, of doing ministry together for the past several years and traveling around the country a little bit. And so this guy, he and his wife, they live down in Florida. We love to go visit them, but uh, he's involved in an outstanding ministry that he's going to be able to tell you all about today. Um, and it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm sure that, uh, that you will understand why by the end of this. So I'm just going to pray over you real quick and let you take the stage. Cool. All right. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will just flow through Tom today, God, that you will um, put the words in his mouth that you want him to be able to speak to us, Lord. I pray that you will open our ears and our eyes to be able to receive what it is that you have for us today, God. And uh, I just pray that he will be empowered by your Spirit, Lord. And um, Lord, we just pray all of these things in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, good morning, Church on a Rock. Uh, I like it. You guys are awake and engaged. So I, my name, is, again, my name is Tom. I, I've had the joy of hanging out with Nathan for a while. And uh, there's a few times that he visited the church that my wife and I pastored in Indiana. And uh, we got to travel and do ministry together, which was incredible. Then all of a sudden, in the midst of doing ministry the, um, in Indiana, God began to stir my wife and my heart to step into a, another opportunity. And as we stepped into this other, this ministry, we began to see not only Um, what God can do in a local church, but what God wants to do inside of a local church around the world. And and I I believe that the church is literally the plan that God has used to not only expand his, his, his great name, but also to bring freedom and rescue and restoration and healing to a broken and dying world. Amen? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the organization that I work for, Destiny Rescue, and then I'm going to preach a little bit. Is that okay? You guys just want me to talk about the organization? You don't want me to preach a little bit? Yeah. You want me to preach? Okay. All right. So Destiny Rescue, we, we believe this reality. The reality is this. Psalm 82, 4 says, rescue the poor and helpless, deliver them from the grasp of evil people. There are people in the world that need rescue. In fact, you should probably understand that we need rescue. Jesus came on the greatest rescue mission of all time to rescue us from our sins, to restore us to a right relationship with God. And that rescue res- literally extends to everybody. Rescue is for everyone. Rescue is for everyone. Amen. Psalm 82 4 is not a biblical suggestion, my friends, it is a biblical commandment. Rescue. It is a command to the people of God who know God's story, who know God's heart, to rescue the poor and helpless. There are people who are vulnerable and exploited and are taken advantage of, and we are to rescue them from the hands of evil people because there are people who mean to do harm. Destiny Rescue is an organization that rescues kids from sexual exploitation and human trafficking, and we help them stay free. We go out into places where we know kids are being sold and we offer them freedom. We go out covertly and and in a way that we can also do investigations to do raids. And as we begin to do raids and and that leads to establishments being shut down, that leads to not only establishments being shut down, but individuals being arrested, traffickers brought to justice. We stand on the border of, of a country where we have 18 border stations where we know that we're stopping kids from being trafficked across this border where they're going to be sold for sex, they're going to be sold for labor trafficking, and potentially organ harvesting. As an organization, we stand on those places because the reality is this, human trafficking is the fastest growing illegal enterprise in the world. Statistics pre-COVID said that in 2020, human trafficking would outpace the sale of guns and drugs. 
Because of the vulnerabilities that were created by a mass, a global pandemic, can I tell you that number has exponentially grown and we're seeing kids and individuals because of vulnerabilities step into situations because they're looking for someone to rescue them and to help them. But I'll get there in just a second. We rescue by raids, by covert border. We also do survival rescues. Some of the work that we do, we're, we're, we're rescuing kids who are standing on street corners who are selling themselves, renting themselves so that they could earn enough money to be able to buy food so that they could eat a meal that day. Our organization is in 10 countries. We're in Southeast Asia, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. We're standing there rescuing kids. And can I, I, I know that I've hit you pretty heavy because you all feel it in the room, right? It's like, huh. I thought Nathan was like, you're bringing this guy in. He's going to like, you know, have an exciting message. And so can I, can I give you, I've given you the bad news. Can I give you the good news? We've been rescuing. We started in 2001. Our founder was on a missions trip where he overheard a child that was being sold for $400. The guy could do whatever, whatever he wanted to that child. It broke his heart. He said, God, if you will open the doors, I will give everything that I can, and I will jump on this field, and I will give myself to this work. He went home. He, was in, he lived in Australia. He sold his business, moved his wife and his family to Bangkok, Thailand, where Destiny Rescue started. And since 2010 until today, we have rescued over 10,000 individuals. That's the good news. Rescue is happening and rescue is happening because the church is rising up. Because I believe that when the church rises up, kids find freedom. When the church rises up, people find freedom. Not only in your community, but around the world. This is the rescue mission that we're all called to. God is calling us to rescue. And as a result of rescue, our organization, we're starting to see some incredible things happen. We're starting to see kids not only get rescued out of sexual exploitation, human trafficking, but we're seeing them stay free because that's our vision. We rescue and we get to see them live free. So each child is, that comes into our care is, is uniquely connected to a freedom plan where we decrease vulnerabilities and we provide opportunities. Some of those opportunities incl- could include a safe bed, urgent health needs, economic empowerment, trauma rehabilitation, and spiritual growth. Every, pl- every country we work in has a plan to share the gospel in a very tangible and real way because rescue is for everyone. We need it physically, we need it emotionally, and we need it spiritually. Amen? Amen. And the church is uniquely positioned to do something about the fastest growing illegal enterprise in the world. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor? neighbor. Oh, come on. Neighbor? We get to rescue today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in in 1 Samuel 17. Probably one of my favorite passages of Scripture. But as I'm I'm sharing 1 Samuel 17, I want you to understand that this, 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 this sermon is born from the realities that we're experiencing as an organization around the world. Things that we've learned over, over a, 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 almost a little over 20 years of rescue work and, and restoration. Things that we've learned that, that I believe God is calling the church to, but it's a lesson that we need to learn today. So if you're ready to learn and you have 1 Samuel 17, whether in your, on your Bible or on your device, would you say amen? amen? So here's what we know to be true. You ready? When there are challenging times, you have to pay attention to who rises up. When there's a challenging moment, you have to pay close attention. Now, if you know the story of 1 Samuel 17, the, the, the people of Israel are locked into a battle with the, the, a group of people called the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are on one side of a valley, and the Israelites are on the other and um, so they're on one hilltop, the Israelites are on another, and there's a valley in the middle called the Valley of Elah where they're going to come down and fight. Now, they, they, this, this conflict has constantly been, like this is historical, like it's been going on for a long time. The Israelites and the Philistines back and forth skirmishes, and, and at some point they just probably got a little tired of doing it the same old way. I mean, have you ever been in a fight with somebody and you just keep having the same old fight over and over and over again? You're like, man, we got to figure out a different way to do this. So the Israelites are, are there and they're knowing that they're getting ready to face off with the Philistines. 
But the Philistines changed tactics. How many of y'all know that when you think you can anticipate what the enemy is going to do, there's a tactical change? Hmm. Okay. So the enemy changes tactics. And what happens is that Goliath, this nine foot tall giant behemoth of a dude, walks out and begins to challenge the people of Israel. Now, the text says, verse 4, Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath. I want you to pause. If, you're, if, you, if you like to write in your Bible, circle that word, highlight it, underline it. The word champion is supposed to be a positive word. It's supposed to in, cause us to rise up and go, man, that, a champion, like that's good. Like every time we watch a, a hero movie, we want to root for the hero, right? Like you pick the hero out early on in the movie and you're like, yep, that's the person. Something's going to happen by the end of it. He, he's, he or she's going to rise up and they're going to win the day and rescue everybody. And, 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 and a champion is good. But can I tell you, as a dear friend of mine says, champions can also be bad. Because the word champion means the one who stands in between you and a potential threat. We're uniquely wired as humanity to look for champions and heroes. We're looking for help. The Bible says early on in Genesis, it's not good for mankind to be alone. We're looking for people. The book of Psalms says one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. We're uniquely positioned and wired as human beings to look for help outside of ourselves because that, I believe, is what God has put inside of all of us so that when trouble comes, we look up Psalm says that when trouble comes, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So we're uniquely looking for a hero. But what stood for the people of Israel was the antithesis, the opposite of a hero. This was somebody who was going to exploit them. What we've learned at Destiny Rescue is in the middle of vulnerabilities, somebody always rises up. They will either be a hero or they will be a villain. But either one of them could fill the role of champion. So we do work in Nepal. And kids in Nepal, like there's the, the, a lot of kids in Nepal are, are struggling with poverty. Um, as they're struggling with poverty, they're on social media, they're looking for jobs because a, a majority of the people in Nepal are, get work visas for a couple of years at a time where they're able to go out and work out of the country and send money back home. And so this, this reality for them is they're looking for jobs outside of the, their villages or their communities. They're looking on social media and traffickers know that there are kids who are looking for jobs. So they begin to, to connect with them as they're looking. There are individuals who will see a profile of a, of a young girl and start a conversation that starts what seems to be very innocent and starts to learn information and gather information and begin to talk to her about pr- how pretty she is and how much he cares for her and how much he sees sympathetic for her and, and, and he's, he's, he's grooming her. And the, normal, the, the, the typical time that it takes from the first conversation to the time that young girl is crossing a border to go potentially marry this guy who she thinks has fallen in love with her is about three months. Our border crossing agents are standing there and they're, they're interviewing these kids and they're, they're, they're unwinding the stories that have been told by a villain, a false champion who's luring them. Goliath is standing on, a, on the hillside calling out to the people of Israel. And if you've ever seen the, the Valley of Elah online, you've ever looked at it, it's a natu- it can be a natural amphitheater where you can call out and your voice rings and echoes. And he began to call out, hey, why don't we fight different this time? Why don't you send one of your, your best soldiers to fight me? And if, we, if he beats me, us Philistines will serve you. We'll become your slaves. But if I beat him, you all become my slave. Trafficking is not that out in the open. It's not that descriptive right out of the gate. Girls who we rescue in Southeast Asia are going to town because they need to find a job to help for, provide for their family. So as they go to town to find a job, they think they're working in a restaurant and somebody's luring them to a brothel or they're forced to serve drinks to customers and rent themselves multiple times a night. 
It's, it's, they're being tricked and trapped. It happens. The villain rises. In the middle of great conflict, villains rise up. And Goliath is this, this villain that, that the, the, the Philistines are looking at as though he's a champion. He was over nine feet tall. And verse 11 says, When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now, I love diving into biblical words. I geek out. I'm just going to be honest. I geek out over stuff like this. Terrified means that they were stuck. They literally froze. You've heard the psychological reaction of fight, flight, or freeze. Terrified for them is they froze, and then they were deeply shaken means that they were reinforced in their stuckness. Isn't that how fear works? Not only are you terrified, do you want to run away or do you, are you, are you freeze? Some of us will rise up and fight, but if the threat's big enough, we freeze and then we just keep getting stuck in this, in this depth of terror and it's a cycle and it keeps going over and over again, especially when a giant likes to repeat himself. The text says he, he taunted Israel for 40 days, morning and night. Now imagine if you heard... So somebody taunting you constantly, every day, twice a day, the same message over and over and over again, you would eventually start to believe them, right? The same lie over and over. See, as Goliath begins to taunt Israel, he knows exactly what he's doing. What he's doing is he's breaking Israel down so that they'll never want to respond. They'll never want to act. The places that we rescue, kids kids believe that that they're broken, that they no longer have value. Their value, their honor, their dignity has been stripped away, and they need somebody. They need somebody to speak truth. So for us, if we're going to address the giant of trafficking, we need to pay close attention to whoever rises up in the moment of vulnerability and tension. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to be scared. Now, I live in the South. The way we say it in the South is you don't got to be scared. You don't got to be scared. You don't have to be frightened or intimidated by false champions. What I love about the story, man, and, and if I had more, Nathan, next time, man, I just need four weeks, bro. Because I could preach an entire series on 1 Samuel 17. Because what happens for for the people of Israel is they're tempted to lose heart. They're deeply shaken. They're stuck. But there's a lot at stake. There's a lot that is going to be forfeited if the people of Israel don't engage with Goliath. That's why they didn't move from the Valley of Elah for 40 days. So can I tell us as the church, capital C, not just church on the rock, but the church across the U.S., we have consistently come up against the battle line to fight injustices around the world, and we may not know how to fight, we may not know what we should do, but we know we should be there because we know there's a lot at stake. So we need to, we need to be encouraged that we're standing on a battle line and we're going, I don't know exactly what to do, man. I don't even know if I can fight that giant and survive, but I'm here because I know that there's a lot at stake because what, they, what the Israelites know is that if Goliath conquers them at the Valley of Elah, they are two stops away from owning the entire nation of Israel because the Valley of Elah You travel four miles down the road to Bethlehem. You travel from Bethlehem to a little town called Gibeah. And Gibeah is where the seat of power, that's where the throne of Israel sits at this time. It's not Jerusalem. Saul had just become king and he established the the capital of Israel at the town of Gibeah. So they know there's a lot at stake in church We know, the moment we hear human trafficking, like everything in us goes, yes, we should fight that. And we stand in the gap and we're not sure exactly what to do. But praise be to God 
that he sends people to say, I, I want to remind us of what we know to be true because Israel in the moment of fighting Goliath, they forgot and they got discouraged and they lost track of who the ultimate rescuer and the ultimate fighter was because Israel thought they were going to have to send somebody. But there was a guy named Jesse who had a son named David and David is sent from Bethlehem to the valley of Elah. See, we don't have to lose heart. We don't have to listen to the lies and believe the lies that this problem is too big and there's nothing we can do about it. Can I rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus? Oh, come on, church. If we are people who are full of the Holy Ghost, if we are people who are are blood-bought, sanctified, and walking in the power of the Spirit of Almighty God, we should be able to take down arguments and lies and make them subject to Christ. I believe that's what Colossians says. We need people to rise up and remind the church, hey, the giant's saying this, but that's not our fight. That's not our battle. We're going to do the things that God tells us to do, but ultimately he's going to be the one that makes the giant fall. I'm getting ahead of myself, and I know you probably know the end of the story better than I do, but I'll get there in just a second. We have a lot to lose, but we're on the battle line. David shows up from Bethlehem, and as he, verse 23 says, As he was talking with them, being the people of Israel, Goliath, the Philistine, the champion from Gath. This is the second time in 1 Samuel 17 that they use the geographical location for the giant where he came from. The reason why is because we need to understand where Gath was in relation to the Valley of Elah. The Valley of Gath was two miles from Elah. David came from Bethlehem. He came four miles. Sometimes, church, if we're going to see giants fall, we got to go double the distance. But the giant falls. I mean, that's literally what Jesus taught us, right? He's like, if I'm going to rescue the world and take on the giant of sin, I'm going to come the farthest to step into the situation. And I'm going to do something that's going to bring freedom and rescue and, and, and wholeness and healing to everyone. So David's just doing what eventually his great, 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 great grandson's going to do. When David heard... The giants shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. And as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. They began to retreat. And David, if you read the rest of the story, David steps up and goes, now, wait a second. He's defying the armies of Israel. He's defying the God of Israel. Now, what's going to be done to this guy? So David, as a 14, 15-year-old, he's a, he's, a, he's a high school, early high school student at this time. He starts talking and engaging, going, hey, do you remember what God has done? Do you remember whose people we are? In 2018, I joined the team at Destiny Rescue, and within a couple of weeks, I was standing in seeing the work that we do in Southeast Asia, and I'm walking into a red light district on rescue with our undercover team, and I am completely and utterly frozen. I'm walking into places where kids are wearing, girls are wearing badges with numbers. They no longer have a name. They no longer have an identity. They're literally called by any guy, and they're forced to come over and sit with that customer, and that customer is going to do horrible things to them because they're trapped in a hellish nightmare. And the hellish, part of the hellish nightmare is that they're, a part of, they're just looked at as a commodity and not a person. And I go back to my hotel room. My wife works for the organization as well, and we're, we're in the hotel room, and I am just broken. And I am weeping. And I'm like, God, I don't understand I was, I was intimidated. The weight of all of it was crashing in around me. And all of a sudden, I heard the Spirit of God say to me, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. If we are the people of God, we should walk like it. We should talk like it. And we should fight like it. Because there are kids waiting for rescue. We've rescued over 10,000 as an organization, but can I tell you, the staggering statistic that we're using right now is there's at least a million kids trapped in this form of exploitation around the world. That's a conservative number, friends. 
It's a conservative number. But we have a lot to fight for. Amen? Amen. If they were your kids, ask yourself the question, what would you do? Now ask yourself the question, if they're God's kids, what are we going to do? Because we walk different, we talk different, we live different, and we fight different. So there's at least a million kids trapped in this form of exploitation, but we don't have to be scared because here's the really good news. We can put our hope in God because he rescues. We can put our trust and faith in God because he's the one ultimately who fights the battle on our behalf. He's the one who rescues, and if it's his desire to rescue, he's going to see it come to pass. The people of Israel are standing across the battle line from Goliath. And as they're standing there, a shepherd boy from Bethlehem rolls up onto the scene. And he begins to talk about, well, I'll go take care of him. And his brothers start talking down to him like, you're just a little guy and you're here just because of your pride and your arrogance. Why don't you go back home to dad and and tend those, those little sheep that you've been taking care of out in the field. You're, the work that you've been doing up until now is insignificant, this, his brother's saying, and he's demeaning him, because sometimes the work that we go to do, the fight that we all as, as the people of God get to fight in, the enemy's trying to convince us that, well, we're, we're not prepared for it, we haven't been ready for it, we haven't, the skill set isn't there, but David looks at, at, the king, at, at King Saul when King Saul says, he's, he's been fighting since his entire life when he was a youth, you're just a kid, you have no experience, you're not going to win, David says, this incredible, says this incredible thing. Verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Sometimes, church, when you're up against it, you just need to remind yourself what God has done. I'm going to keep saying it until I get an amen. Amen. When you're up against it, you need to look back and remind yourself what God has done. Because what God has done in the past, he will do it again. See, I can tell you that in the times of my life where God has come through, I shouldn't be here right now, but I am because of the grace and power of Almighty God. When the enemy tries to, 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 to come against me and to, and to cause me to be fearful of what, what's happening right now, all I have to do is look back and go, God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you don't change like the shifting of shadows, I know you're faithful today and what you did then, you will do now. Can I tell you that's the best evangelism strategy you can ever have, church? Amen. You just look back and testify on what God has done. And you tell people what God has done. And you testify and bear witness to what God is doing in your life. Because when there are people who are questioning, is there a God in heaven? Does he have power? Can he save? Can he help me? When they look at you and hear your story and see what God has done and hear you tell about what all that God has done, they will say, if God does it for them, maybe he'll do it for me. Maybe he'll do it for me. One of our rescue managers is a pastor. And he went into a brothel to try to to be able to talk to some of the girls and to eventually rescue them out. And as 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 he's there, he walks by the brothel owner who's laying on a couch. And the brothel owner's gray in color and is dying. And the brothel owner looks up at him, and he engages him in conversation and says, I, I want to be able to come in and talk to anybody that I can, and I want your permission to do so. Which is really gutsy. The brothel owner says, no. He goes, what's wrong with you? He goes, the doctors don't know, but I, they think I'm dying. He goes, I believe my God can heal you, so if I pray for you and my God heals you and raises you up, can I go talk to anybody in the room that I want to? He goes, if your God can do that, then yeah, sure, you can do that. And he laid hands on him and prayed for him and stood him up off the couch. And the guy regained color and the guy's alive today. Do we have faith to believe that God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever? The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is the same God today who lives and rules and reigns. The earth is the fullness of God's. Do we believe that? 
then we had better walk like it, church. Because there is a growing evil in the world. And the only answer for it is the people of God. The only answer for it is the spirit of Almighty God. I got way off track. That's not where I was supposed to go, but that's okay. Saul finally consents to David and says, All right, go ahead, and may the Lord be with you. So Saul blesses David, and David goes off after Goes, goes off after Goliath. But can I tell you that in this moment, Saul and David are contrasted. You have the king of Israel who's supposed to know and be confident in the movement of God, who has seen God do amazing things, but yet in the middle of his situation, he forgot, and he was overwhelmed, and he shut down. And I'm not picking on Saul because I've been there. We just need somebody to remind us. We just need to look back and have faith and be encouraged. So David comes and does that for Saul and reminds them, this shepherd boy who's shepherding a flock of sheep out in the field, comes to take care of a, Goliath, a giant that Saul should have taken care of as the shepherd of the flock of God's people. Verse 46. Today, David talking to, to, to Goliath, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you, and I will cut off your head. See, I told you we got to talk a little different. We've got to talk faith. Instead of fear, we got to talk victory instead of defeat. We have to talk different, we act different, we think different, and we fight different. So he says, today the Lord will conquer you, and I'm going to kill you and cut your head off. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. It's not going to just be you, giant, who falls, but everything, your entire operation's coming down in the name of Jesus. And when it does, everyone will know that there is a God in heaven. You know what I love? I love the fact that there are kids who, when they're rescued and they start talking to our aftercare team, our aftercare team begins to talk to them about the hope that they have and why they rest. The kids will go, why did you rescue me? And they will tell them, they will start giving, re- re- restoring dignity and value and talking to these kids because they love them. And as these kids are being loved, they're like, why are you this way? And they talk about Jesus. And they're like, well, we don't know this Jesus. And our aftercare teams in one of our countries says, that's okay. Just call out to him and look for him because when you look for him, you will find him. And there are kids going to bed at night, lying their head on a pillow, asking the God of heaven, if you're real, will you show up? And they're waking up testifying that they had a dream, a vision of the God of the universe saying that they are loved, that they are worthy, they have value, that they're safe, and that he can restore them and heal them. Whoo! Man, I'm about to take a lap. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But... Nathan said I'm politically correct and I won't offend anybody, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it. This is the biggest but in Scripture. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. Destiny Rescue has a goal of rescuing 100,000 kids by 2030 and being in 30 countries. And you're like, you guys just rescued 10,000 and it's 2022. You got eight years to go. Are you going to make it? Like I saw some of you guys doing the math. You're like, you're in 10 countries. You got 20 to go. You're a third of the way there. Are you going to make it? This battle isn't ours. It's the Lord's. I would love to tell you all the new countries that are coming. Our goal this coming year, we've already identified places. We're hoping to launch 12 new, new countries, rescue countries, this coming year. And oh, by the way, just in case you want more encouragement, we've rescued almost 3,000 this year alone. This battle isn't ours. It's the Lord's. So our team rushes the fight knowing that the giant's going to fall. But we know this to be true, because remember when I, started this, when I started sharing about 1 Samuel, I shared with you that there's some implications of the work that we're doing that plays itself out 
in our theological walk. It is a, because we are in a spiritual battle with physical applications, my friends. And the, the physical applications are the things that we need to be doing, the things that we're learning. And one of the things that I know to be true that I'm learning is that if a giant's going to fall, you've got to pick up your slingshot. So I'm one of those pastors that I've got to have something in my hand to remind me. I've got to have visual reminders. I'm very much like the, the, the Old Testament where, where they had to build pillars of memory and they would remind themselves... So I have something that reminds me that if a giant's going to fall, I've got to pick up a slingshot. I bought it on Amazon. Eight bucks. Don't worry, I'm not going to use it because the first time I tried, I about knocked myself out. <laughs> David, David was a shepherd. And if you do the study on the shepherds of Israel you will find that they carried two things with them. They carried a, a shepherd's staff that was kind of thick, that acted like a club, that they could just beat things away, or they could kind of just tap and shoo the sheep along. It was, an, it was, a, it was a, a tool to be used both good and for war. But the things that they were deadly accurate with were slingshots. And they'd pick up rocks, put it in here, and they'd whip that thing around, and then boom! They'd hit... Like, there are guys who are, who are literally, you can watch YouTube, they're, they're over 100 yards away, and they're hitting bullseyes. So I was praying for you guys this week. I felt the Spirit of God say that you all have slingshots in your hands, and you've been using them and training yourself for war. This is how you use a slingshot in a local church. Somebody needs prayer, so you go up and you pray with them. You teach a Bible study. You, you, you give encouragement when somebody's down. When you're praying for somebody and you have the, the, the Lord comes upon you with a word for them, a word of encouragement or a prophetic word, and you give it, you're using your slingshot. You're using what's in your hands to carry out the work of God, the mission of God, the purposes of God in the spirit of God. And David is just simply using the tool that's in his hands. It's not much. It's a piece of leather and two leather cords. And he's running at a giant, nine foot, over nine foot tall, trusting that the God of the universe will take what's in his hands and knock that giant down. You've been using your, you've been training with your slingshot. The Lord says it is time to use it to knock down some giants. There are giants in your community that need to fall in the name of Jesus. And he's uniquely positioned you to do it. There are giants around the world that are needing to come down and he has uniquely positioned the people of God to do it. You've just got to be willing to use what's in your hands because God's going to take it and he's going to show you how accurate he is with the gifts that you have. Sometimes we think we're responsible for the, the impact or the results of our gifts. We're not. We're just simply responsible to offer it, and he takes it and uses it. You want to know how? This is how I know to, this, to be tr this principle to be true. If you look at the giant, when he gets hit in the forehead with the rock, how does the giant fall? He falls forward. I got a D in physics when I was in high school. But I know this to be true. If you have an object moving this way with great force and velocity and mass, and it hits something, that's going to continue to move because it's, it's all, all the force is going that way. Goliath should have fallen backwards. Why does he fall forwards? I love it. He falls forwards, Jewish scholars say, to prove to an entire army behind him that that boy David didn't have to do a single thing because in the moment when God wanted the giant to fall, on his face. And, and theologically, 
How do we worship God? Boom. On our face. You want to back it up even more when David is king? The Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant and they take it into the temple of Dagon, their God. The next morning they wake up. Where's Dagon? On his face. Happens twice. I just want to encourage you, continue to read the Bible because, whoo, man, I, I, could, I could preach a whole series and there are people who do it better than me. But here's the point. God wants your obedience and your gifts your talents. God wants to use you, what you have in your hands. And it does not matter how big or how small you think it is. God's going to show you what he can do with what you have in your hands because he's taken out giants. Will you use what's in your hand to bring down a giant. Will you you use the gift of intercession that you have? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, will you use your gifts to bring down giants? You want to know how you address trafficking realities here in the U.S., you have an amazing children's ministry and amazing youth ministry. Youth leaders, children's ministry workers, keep using your slingshots and invest in these dear kids. Will you use what you have? There's a reason why in children's ministry we would sing only a boy named David, only a rippling brook, only a boy named David and five little stones he took. Because we want to instill in kids from an early age that it doesn't matter the size of the stone, the size of the person slinging the slingshot. What matters is a heart obedient to to God and willing to step out and to meet him and to trust him. Because when you trust him, the giant falls. So I'm standing standing in in a red light district. It's a mile and a half long. And at a mile and a half, this mile and a half strip on either side, later on in the evening, all the girls come out of the bars and they stand on the street corner so that guys can come grab them and take them to, to rent by the moment hotels. And they're three deep, shoulder to shoulder. And at the end of the, at the, end of the red light district, there is an ominous sign advertising for one of the biggest bars. And it took a place of prominence because you have to be cautious and mindful of who rises up in moments of challenge and hardship. And you can see the false champion. Because church... We are engaged in a spiritual battle with physical implications. God's going to call us today to do something to rescue kids. I believe it. And as he does so, we have to be willing to step out onto the field of battle and join him. We have a lot. We have a lot at stake. I told you that the Valley of Elah was four miles from Bethlehem and just a couple more miles and the the Philistines would get to Gibeah and they would own the entire real estate of the land of Israel. They had a lot at stake for this fight. And God God brought somebody to use what was in his hands to knock down a giant. And there's a lot at stake for the fight that we're in today for kids, trapped in the hellish realities of trafficking and exploitation. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to see firsthand what's at stake. बंद कमरे में बहुत मैंने रोया भी थी बंद कमरे में बाहर नहीं निकलने देते थे बिल्कुल बाहर निकलने के लिए बिल्कुल रास्ता ही नहीं था सारे रास्ते वहां बंद है एक दिन में तो या 20 या 25 मतलब जितना कस्टमर आता था उन उन कस्टमर को हैंडल करना पड़ता 
अगर एक भी कस्टमर छूट गया ना तो हमें पकड़ के मार देते तो उन्होंने मुझे बहुत मारे बहुत मुझे अभी भी मुझे पूरा जिसम पे निशानी है जिंदगी में कभी मैंने सोचा नहीं था मैं निकलो वहां से तो मुझे सिर्फ यही लगता था मैं मर जाऊं अब तो मेरे जिंदगी अब मेरे से हुआ नहीं था हिम्मत से मैं हर गई थी पता नहीं भैया ने मुझे कैसे आए परमेश्वर में मेरे लिए वेजे होंगे हिम्मत करके बहुत हिम्मत करके मैं निकल गई वहां से You can rescue kids out of sexual exploitation, human trafficking like Aya. What I love about Aya is you saw it right there at the end after the video um kind of came back. She began to bear witness to the fact that God sent a rescue agent. And that rescue agent was able to bring hope and courage for her to escape. If you want to know how Aya got out of where she was at, come find me at my table. I'd love to talk more. Because It's a it's an incredible rest of the story. But I is free. And there are kids around the world who still aren't yet. And the way that you get to be a part of using your slingshot is you're going to get to help rescue kids. Talking to Pastor Nathan and and others, we the the the, the opportunity for you as a church is that that $1500 rescues a child from exploitation trafficking and starts her aftercare process that process that we talked about that was a safe bed and could include education and um all of those things you get to help be a part of that $1500 to rescue a child but there's also another way that you can rescue and it's called a rescue partner across the stage here are what we what we have is rescue partner packs Now this isn't child sponsorship. Child sponsorship, we love that. Love them because they're they're helping a specific child. The kids who come into our care once we rescue, they're on our care for just a little bit of time until then we follow up with them in an extended period of time. But because of how we're able to do the work that we're doing, you will be able to bring rescue to a different child each month. And the beautiful thing about how we do rescue partner is it doesn't matter what dollar amount that it is, that you sign up for. You pray, you hear from the Lord, whatever the Lord asks you to do, whatever the Lord puts in your slingshot. You say, "God, here it is. I'm going to send it down range and I'm going to I believe that that giant's going to fall and you're going to get to help rescue 12 kids a year at whatever dollar amount. Whether that's $5, $20, $30, $50, whatever it might be that the Lord puts on your heart. But I'm going to ask you to take a stand like David and to take a step across the battle line and bring your slingshot and knock down a giant i'm going to ask you to do that here in just a second i want to explain to you how to do the rescue partner pack inside the rescue partner pack is is the the profile story of one of the kids that we've been able to rescue so you're going to get their full story and the timeline of how they were rescued the operation whether it was covert or a raid or border station you're going to get the full details of their story and in that you're going to see an envelope that looks like this you're going to pull that envelope out you're going to open it up and you're going to fill out your information you're going to close that up and then you're going to hand it back to me before you leave today and the reason why is because we want to give you this but we we we're going to take this with us and we're going to, I'm going to process it so that way we can start the process moving for kids to be free And now, out on my table there are there are, are other stories if you need time to pray about or you need to go home and talk to your wife or your husband like there's there's opportunity for you to still be a part you can take that but what I'm going to ask is if you're going to sign up today to take a step across the battle line today that you would come up and fill this out and then you would leave that envelope with me before you leave today So I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me for just a moment Father, we believe that this moment you're calling us to be like David. People full of faith to use what we have in our hands to bring freedom and rescue. So God, by your holy spirit, would you give us the courage to like David run across the battle line and face off and to say, "The Lord will show to everyone today that he is God." And that this battle isn't ours, it is the Lord's, but we're going to join him in it in Jesus name. Amen. I want to ask if you want to take if you want to become a rescue partner if you would just 
have the courage to walk up and grab one of these right now. God, thank you that you empower us to do things that we couldn't do on our own. God, to use the, the tools, the skills, the, the talents, the slingshot that you've put in our hands, and to know, God, that there's going to be freedom brought to kids around the world. God, how incredible it is that you would use us people to be about your business of rescue. God, we know and believe that you are the greatest rescuer of all time. And Father, we pray right now that we would not only the courage to do, to, to celebrate, God, that, the courage that we have in this moment, but God, would we lean in to how you're moving and to have faith to believe that you can knock down the giant that we might be facing in our life. You know, I said in the sermon that we can put our hope in God because he rescues and I told you that there was a, a definition of a champion that could be villain. But can I, can I give you, my friend who taught me that, he also taught me another definition for the word champion. Can I give it to you? Sure? I, someone who's blood stained and battle tested. Did you catch it? Blood stained, battle tested victorious, King of kings, Lord of lords. At the name of Jesus Christ, everything bows on heaven, under, on, in earth, or in earth, in heaven, under the earth. Everything bows at the name of Jesus. Bloodstained, battle-tested champion. I don't know what you're going through today, but maybe you need to be reminded that there is a blood-stained battle champion who fights on your behalf. And I want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask if, there's a, if you needed the reminder today personally that there is a blood-stained warrior who has overcome death, hell, and the grave and who can bring victory to you and lay down, knock down your giant, if you needed that reminder, would you lift your hand this morning? As you look around the room and you see hands that are raised, would you do me a favor and just go around and put your hands on them? And we're going to pray together. Because that's one of the things that, as I was talking with Nathan and Brittany about your church, one of the things that they shared that has just been an incredible marker for your church is the community of faith that is in this group of people. And I believe that we're going to continue to, you guys should continue to do that. Encourage one another, lift one another up, pray for each other, and do ministry for one another. And I'm going to ask you to just join me in prayer. Father, for every person who lifted their hands that said they needed to, the reminder that we have a blood-stained, battle-tested champion in heaven who is all-victorious and all-powerful, God, we pray that you administer peace to them right now. God, you administer encouragement. Because God, what happened when David, when David shot off the rock to this and hit, hit Goliath, Goliath fell, he cut off his head, and then the army of Israel charged. So God, there are moments where we, we're not sure the step to take in the situations that we're in, but God, because there is victory, it gives us the courage to run. So God, I speak courage over every person who raised their hands today. God, courage to believe that you're leading them to, through the battle, that you're going to be the one who fights on their behalf, that the giant they're facing, whatever it is, physical, emotional, spiritual, God, whatever the giant is that they face has to bow at the name of Jesus, is defeated because Jesus, you are victorious. So God, we proclaim your victory. God, we declare freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, freedom from, from anything that would hold them captive. God, we declare freedom over them in the name of Jesus. And we proclaim your victory and we celebrate today, God, that we fight from victory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Church, today, kids are gonna go free because of you. Kids are going to go free because you have taken the step not only to, to give, not only to become a rescue partner, but I know that you're going to pray. Out at my table, you've got an opportunity to sign up to get prayer updates periodically, to know how to continue to stay in the fight. 
Those of you who, who signed up to be rescue partners, you're going to get consistent communication about all the things that are happening. But I, I want to remind you before I hand it back over to Pastor Nathan, if you would please fill that envelope out, give it to me before you leave today. And if you still want time to make a decision and pray about it and ask God, you can stop by the table. I've got something for you to take home with you. It has been a blessing to be with you all and to celebrate with you that there are over 10,000 kids and individuals walking free today. And there's going to be thousands more because the people of God rise up. Because as I said in the beginning, when the people of God rise up, kids find freedom. Thanks so much, church.